All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to New Mexico Black Leadership Council's Afrofuturism Lecture Series. Today is part three of our three-part series centering around Afrofuturism. This event is part of the 10th annual New Mexico Black History Festival, which has extended beyond February Black History Month into a year-round celebration which is why we are so excited to bring you this series honoring and uplifting our Black superheroines in March, which as we know is Women's History Month. Thank you so much for being here with us today and special thanks to our partner, the University of New Mexico African American Student Services for assisting us in spreading the word about this series. My name is Kendra Hill and I'm the Senior Projects Manager for the New Mexico Black Leadership Council. I'm so happy to be here with you all today to get some incredible knowledge and insight from our presenter today. The New Mexico Black Leadership Council serves as a hub to create a viable and sustainable social profit sector in New Mexico. It is important to recognize the land that we are situated on is indigenous, unceded Tiwa land in what is known as the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our services and programs focus on five key areas, which are civic engagement, health, leadership development, positive youth development, and cultural vibrancy. Our lecture series today encompasses the cultural vibrancy portion of that wheel of engagement there, and it's my honor to be your host today on this mission. We often get questions about why Afrofuturism is important. We have to understand why the past is important in order for us to prosper in the future. Therefore, we take our past to both predict and shape our futures and to negotiate and interpret the present. Zora Neale Hurston, a renowned artist during the Harlem Renaissance said it best. The present was an egg laid by the past that had the future inside its shell. My Wakanda moment, meaning I discovered this place of being that made me feel empowered, was knowing that art and literature detailing the possibilities of African people around the world exist, is recognized, and is celebrated. One way this is celebrated is through comics. I realized I was a comic book geek, and I did a little research and I found the coolest thing. There's a free virtual exhibition you can visit in your own free time titled Beyond the Black Panther, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics. The curator, English professor, Julian C. Chambliss of Michigan State University described Afrofuturism as the following. I like to ask people to think of Afrofuturism as the intersection of speculation and liberation. Then the context of comics, these are the stories and characters that have something to say about the future from a Black perspective. I know I'm going to be exploring this exhibition as well to really get myself grounded in these themes and how I interpret my current reality in conjunction with our collective future as Africans. We put in the Zoom chat the link for you to explore the virtual exhibit for yourself. It is free to access and it will be running online until May 29th, 2021. Don't miss your chance to check it out. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Finney Coleman, the moderator for our lecture series. Dr. Coleman is president of the Faculty Senate at the University of New Mexico, where he teaches courses in African-American literature, history, and culture. Welcome back, Dr. Finney Coleman. Thank you for being our moderator through this series. And I'm very happy to have you with us today for our third lecture. Hi, Kendra. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come back. Um, and to complete this remarkable lecture series that, that we've, we've had. Welcome everyone to Afrofuturism from our screens to reality. This has been a three-part lecture series which discussed what a new generation of black women superheroes has looked like through the lens of Afrofuturism. And then by three black women scholars who are just outstanding in their field of study. We began the series with Dr. Belinda Deneen Wallace and her incredible presentation on Lovecraft Country and Ingenue Ellis' complex portrayal of Hippolyta or Hippolyta for those of us who uh, know the series. Um, last week, we were joined by Virginia Commonwealth University's Dr. Kimberly Nichelle Brown, who provided an in-depth look at Regina King's character, Angela Abar in HBO series, Watchmen where Dr. Brown coined the term subversive masking. We're still unpacking that here. Uh, a, a great discussion from, uh, from Dr. Brown. Before we close 
today's with today's session, I want to thank Dr. Wallace and I want to thank Dr. Brown for making this series such a success so far. Today, it's my honor to introduce our final presenter, Dr. Andrea Mays from the University of New Mexico. Her presentation will be on Janelle Monet's emotion picture, Dirty Computer, titled Unbought and Unbossed, Janelle Monet's Productive Performance at the Intersections of the Black Political Consciousness, Black Materiality, and Afrofuturism. Dr. Mays, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. I'm glad yeah, to be here. I, go ahead. I'm glad to be here. We're glad to have you. I, I want to tell you all a little bit about my, my friend, my colleague, Andrea L. Mays. She holds a PhD in American studies focusing on 20th and 21st century African-American culture and politics, visual culture, and gender studies. She also has an MA in comparative literature and cultural studies and a BA in communications from George Mason University. Dr. Mays is a Mellon Fellow. She's one of UNM's Provost Race and Social Justice Teaching Fellows. And she is an award-winning lecturer in Women's Studies, Gender and Sexuality Studies Program and UNM's Department of American Studies. She teaches courses in Feminist Studies, Film Literature and Race, Class and Gender Studies. That's a lot. We're so glad to have you. You know, before we get started with the lecture, we, ha we have an opening query for all of you to respond to. Uh, in order to participate in the query, we ask that you click the link that has been dropped in the chat or scan the QR code that's on your screen to get access to that question, right? So once we finish the opening query and the lecture begins, please keep that link open. At the end of the show, you will have a live Q&A called After Effects. We will have that. And you will see an option to enter your questions in real time into the Mentimeter while the presentation is ongoing. Dr. Mays and I will take as many of your questions as possible uh, from that Mentimeter poll and answer them at that time. Um, our opening query question for today's presentation is this. What is the value of time travel for black folks in the diaspora. I've been thinking about that since I first uh, heard the question. I imagine that question has some significance for you, eh, Dr. Mays? Yes, it does. And I'm really interested to, to see what people are thinking here. Uh, I see some really cool answers. Agency, that we get to skip the bad parts in our past. Yeah, these are interesting. Sankofa right? The right of return, an ability to control, to claim. It's wonderful to see that so many of these answers take up the issue of agency. <laughs> and then, right? And then there's revenge, right? And also the notion of fragmented um, past, access to those fragmented past. When we're teaching about this, that, that always comes up, doesn't it? How do you, how do we cult craft a usable past from what a lot of people see as a problematic past? I, it's a remarkable uh, question. An ability mm -hmm. to control that which had been controlled for folks of African descent. Mm -hmm. What about that, that one, the one here? Do you want to say anything about there are black people in the future? We're not going extinct. We have not been defeated. We out here. What do you think about that one? I think that's a wonderful one. And I think that's one that's actually a pillar of the whole concept of Afrofuturism. There's this wonderful line in uh, Django Jane where Janelle Monet says, you, you know, if you think we're essentially, if you think we're going somewhere, you better plant a flag on a whole nother planet because we're not, <laughs> right? Yeah. So opportunities to see the past and the future and bring back knowledge that can help us in the present. I think that's a brilliant way of, of summing up this, this, this Mentimeter. Um, let's go on. I, I'm so excited to, to hear your presentation. You know, there's... Um, one last bit of household keeping. Make sure you keep that link open and uh, to put those questions. Hey, let's get to Dr. Mays. Let's go. I'm looking forward to this. 
Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the warm introduction, Dr. Coleman, and thank you very much for um, everyone who has supported uh, this presentation at the Black Leadership Council, Catherine McGill and Daphne Shauna Brown and uh, Kimberly, I, I, uh, Kendra, I'm very grateful to all your support with everything. And I'm excited to be here and I wanna thank particularly the audience, because I know we are all zoomed out and to agree to sit through a presentation at four o'clock in the evening is a commitment. So I appreciate that commitment from you and I'll do my level best to make it worth your while. I would also like to second Dr. Coleman's uh, gratitude to my colleagues who began this series, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Brown, for setting the bar so high and for giving me inspiration to think through some of the ideas I'm exploring for this presentation. So without further ado, I shall begin. Uh, unbought and unbossed, Janelle Monet's productive performance at the intersections of Black political consciousness, Black materiality, and Afrofuturism. This was the original title that I submitted shortly after I uh, agreed to give this talk. And I thought it was apt. In many ways, it still is apt. I will be dealing with uh, Monet's performance in Dirty Computer at these intersections. And the reason that I, I use the first part of this title was to name check and recognize a woman to whom we owe, owe a great deal, uh, Shirley Chisholm. The first part of the title took its name from her biography, which was based on her presidential, unprecedented presidential run in 1972, wherein she took delegates to the Democratic National Convention. Um, and whenever we can, or whenever I have the opportunity to index the amazing contributions of Black women, I'm always happy to do so. And acknowledging that Monel, Monet's work stands in these legacies is an important part of this presentation. And I think Shirley Chisholm is an important figure to, uh, to acknowledge in that. But after investigating further Monet's work and examining the various levels of her productivity, I had to uh, change the title. And we'll come back to that later. The reason for it and the new title as it fits into this presentation. Before we get started with that though, I'd like for us to, or I'd like to introduce you to some of the disciplines that I'm putting in constellation in this talk because I, I think it's important to ground this conversation, which I, which I hope this will ultimately end up being a conversation about this productive performance by young maestra Janelle Monet. Black feminist thought and political traditions are a central part of Dirty Computer. And Collins, Patricia Hill Collins' Black feminist theory, um, concepts of struggle, and the historical practices for black women of naming and renaming themselves in political circumstances. But most importantly, I am marrying or linking uh, Monet's performance in Dirty Computer with Audre Lorde's concept in uses of the erotic. Secondly, the theory of the black diaspora, particularly black Atlantic framework uh, introduced to us by black, black British cultural studies theorist, Paul Gilroy in 1993, is an important framework through which to understand Monet's inheritance as a figure in the black diaspora, as well as the legacy she leaves in her art. In addition to that, I am also drawing on the black Atlantic work by poet and thinker Dion Brand to examine the meaning of the Black Atlantic, what it means for us folks in the diaspora, in the Black diaspora. And of course, as is the theme of this program, it's important that I stick to the mission, which is to illuminate, lift up, and hold in my consciousness the concept of Afrofuturism, right? 
and particularly the, af the aspirational vision of a future of Black people, Black network consciousness being the concept on which I'm going to draw to explain Monet's work, right? Which is a particular concept I am taking from Afrofuturism, a prehistory by Isaiah Lavender III, which was published in 2019. And finally, of course, this work, my reading here, is informed by my training as an American studies, cultural studies, and Black feminist scholar. Cultural studies readings and practices acknowledge the productive possibilities in the cultural work, in popular culture, in visual culture and music across both intellectual, theoretical, and expressive forms. So this is going to be part narrative analysis of and part analysis of visual culture to illuminate Monet's black feminist praxis, which is the bottom line with Dirty Computer. It is black feminist praxis. So, trying to get forward here. So as I've said, I had to change the name of this presentation. And in the remix, rather than just examine it, examining it as a, as a piece of popular culture or cultural production for general consumption, I want to look at it through, I wanted to look at it through a specifically black lens, right, within the diaspora. And I wanted to do this for a number of reasons, one of which being when I started reading the reviews and critiques of Dirty Computer, a couple of phrases kept coming up for me. Uh, it's a celebration of sexuality. It's a celebration of feminine beauty. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement of a liberation of sex. I mean, these are the kind of phrases that kept coming up in the analysis. And, and I wasn't quite comfortable with with that because a celebration of sex, if you will, while perfectly wonderful and I can deeply appreciate it, is only skin deep. Whereas liberation is to the bone. And it was my understanding upon viewing Dirty Computer several times that more than a narrative of sexual expression or sexual joy, which it is those things as well, it is a liberation narrative. And as a liberation narrative, we need to call it thus, right? So I renamed it Dirty Computer and Other Liberation Narratives from the Black Diaspora by Janelle Monet. So for those of you who do not know, and I would imagine there are only a few of you who do not know who Janelle Monet is, I would like to introduce her as a subject of this presentation. Janelle Monet is a self-declared arced android, Cindy Mayweather, cast into an interstellar diaspora. This was her opening act. This is how she introduced herself into the public sphere with a series of singles releases where her alter ego was an arch android and subsequent albums or CDs for those of you who didn't ride a dinosaur to school or downloads, right? Um, she was a figure who, you know, was an art, was not human. She was from the future. She was not only in um, a, what we later in this presentation are going to acknowledge as the black diaspora, but she was an interstellar diaspora. Monet's origins, were uh, where this idea of herself, this alter ego came into fruition, was in various black arts and creative communities in Kansas City and in Atlanta, where she helped found organizations like Fem the Future and the Atlanta arts community and collaborated with other like-minded Afrofuturist artists and entertainers. Monet's art, in her early releases and throughout her creative production um, 
has had futuristic themes. And I imagine many of you are familiar with some of the work that she has done, but that was the opening and much toward what I would call the late middle of her career. And I would also suggest that the piece that I am going to focus on in this presentation and, and which you will see references that point where there is a turn from the late middle career that Jan Janelle Monet uh, articulates as a part of her political and creative mission to the moment that we find her in in Dirty Computer. Dirty Computer as a liberation narrative has been expressed by Monet as a musical contribution born out of struggle. It comprises a series of videos undergirded by political consciousness of black people's material experience as under threat and in resistance. This is important for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the, the CD premiered in 2018, two years into one could argue one of the more turbulent eras of recent American politics on the heels of the election of Donald Trump. Within this narrative of Dirty Computer, Monet linked together uh, a futuristic uh, a series of videos linked together by a futuristic dy dystopia, wherein Monet is cast as a character who is abducted and interned for reprogramming, i.e. memory erasure. And this is because she is a dirty computer. Dirty computer reference within the context of this video and from Monet's own mouth are those things, those elements of imperfection that humans have outside of what social normativity and political normativity are. And this is important for a number of reasons related to Janelle Monet. Uh, and the themes she takes up throughout the course of Dirty Computer as issues that need to, uh, issues that she needs to liberate and constrictions that she needs to be liberated from through them. Uh, this emotion picture that Janelle Monet can, uh, offers us uh, is deeply personal. And being born out of struggle, I wanna say uh, it's important here to underscore the importance of the emotion of the picture, right? And I wanna de define emotion as I understand it in the context of this, this, uh, this video and in the context of the whole entire project. In basic terms, Miriam Webster's definition of emotion follows a conscious mental reaction, i.e. anger, fear, subjectively experienced, a strong feeling accompanied by psychological and behavioral changes in the body. It's important to put in the body in tension with the cursory readings that initially accompanied this, this video this emotion picture, which beg the audience to look a little deeper than simply an expression of sexuality, which is a problematic terrain when we think about presentations of black female bodies in cinema in general, right? I would, I would argue it's a, it's a lazy approach to thinking about the creative and political and artistic work that Monet is doing. So Monet in Dirty Computer as the character Jane 58721 is captured in turn and set to be cleaned because she has some bugs, right? And her bugs are that she is black in the diaspora, she is queer in the diaspora, specifically pansexual, if I'm linking this meaning to Janelle Monet herself, the artist, not the character. 
And she is a woman in the diaspora. And in thinking through the meaning of uh, this video, the whole entire emotion picture, a phrase from Audre Lorde's work kept coming back to me. When I say I'm a black feminist, I mean I recognize that my power as well as my primary oppression comes as a result of my blackness as well as my womanness. When I say I am a black lesbian, I mean I'm a woman whose primary focus of loving, physical as well as emotional is directed to women. It does not mean I hate men, far from it. And the last part of that is important in a number of ways, right? Because oftentimes characters, queer black characters, queer black female characters are set up in, in, in terms that uh, are underwritten by their dislike or um, resistance to loving black men. And the truth of the matter is in the diaspora, we black people love each other often primarily, right? Because we love each other in the diaspora. Therefore, thinking about these things, thinking about um, ideas and the conditions which might separate us in terms of um, categories of identity that we understand in addition to who we are in the di diaspora are not enough to di discount our predisposition politically, intellectually, and emotionally to love each other. But there's another level of love at work, right? And emotion at work in Janelle Monet's Dirty Computer which also ask us to drill down again on the thinking and the logic that Audre Lorde as a poet and a thinker and a creator brings to this conversation of Dirty Computer as a liberation narrative, a source of power. We're talking about the productive performances of women of African descent in the public realm as superpowers, as productive sources, as powerful. And Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic, right? The erotic is a measure between the beginning of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. For having experienced the fullness of this depth of feeling, and recognizing its power and honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. The backstory behind Dirty Computer and Janelle Monet's risk in her very deliberate choice to express herself in deeply personal and emotional terms in this video, in narratives, in celebration of herself as a black woman in celebration of other black women, while beautiful and recognized and award-winning was a giant risk. Historically, in African-American history and culture, or, or from this side of the lens of history, in this political moment, we have more than a few examples of black queer women to be celebrated who recognize themselves as full and holistic beings, free to love and live and practice their art um, as who they were. And from this long lens of history, we can say, and, and much of the recent cultural production uh, reflects this, that Billie Holiday could be identified as queer or that Josephine Baker identified as queer or other subjects. The funny thing about this for me was that this often happened after these figures had passed. This was not common knowledge. So too is the case with figures like Moms Mabley, right? This is in the past. The risk that, that Janelle Monet's dirty computer takes is that it lays this fact of her bare. This is the first creative production 
wherein Monet drop, excuse me, drops the persona of the android and assumes the persona of a black woman who loves black women unabashedly and unashamed through, in, and outside of her art. Returning to the terms, I think it's important to consider here uh, what the Black diaspora and Black Atlantic as specific and different, right? The Black Atlantic was the gateway through which African peoples passed and have been transformed in self-understanding, political consciousness. As a gateway, this has shaped Black people's subsequent experiences and informs our notions of resistance, survival, and community through and beyond the Middle Passage. In a very basic sense, the Black Atlantic is a, is a specific theoretical frame and it has to do with uh, ideas and concepts such as racial capitalism and targets the flows and transfers of peoples and commerce, right? Through various locations across the Atlantic Ocean in colonial practices. And here I wanna draw on poet and thinker Dion Brand's work uh, in her book, a map to the door of no return, notes on belonging, in which she examines the Black Atlantic in another way, right? As a space where it is most potentially um, productive to rename the experience of being from the African continent. Dion Brand writes, the place where all names were forgotten and all beginnings recast. In some desolate sense, it was the creation place of Blacks in the New World diaspora, at the same time that it signified the end of traceable beginnings. Beginnings that can be noted through a name or a set of family stories that extend further into the past than 500 years, or the kinds of beginnings that can be expressed in a name which in turn marked out territory or occupation. To me, this is an important point to raise about Monet's work as a, as a creator, a um, productive artist in the diaspora is because Monet's work speaks across a range, not only of creative production, uh, uh, cultural production, but also ideological, experiential, um, and geographical spaces. This is the very condition of being in the di diaspora. And if we are going to take this as the moment in the trajectory of Monet's career, Dirty Computer is the moment that indexes a moment for her creatively of no return in terms of what she puts on the line to make the statements that she is making in the, in the, um, in the emotion picture. The importance of naming and renaming oneself not only indexes the rupture and the need to transform, it also operates as a place of self-authority and a practice of paradigm change. And this is one legacy, again, that Monet stands in. Black feminist political traditions of self-naming, right? She is self, she is naming, renaming herself in the public realm and in the, the erotic, sexual, creative, and political freedom that she is assuming with the, with the production of Dirty Computer. And this, the legacy that she stands in is the, is the legacy of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, certainly Audre Lorde and Zami, and you know, in, in, par, in common parlance, right? 
Whoopi Goldberg from Karen Elaine Johnson, assuming control of her career through an avatar, right? Wherein she practices her, her creative art. All right. So we've done, we've dealt with the diaspora, which I also want to say, we, we think about it in terms of the history, the diaspora, you know, we think about the black diaspora, people want to fix it in our past. But the diaspora is a continuing and ongoing reality. Okay. Um, I have a friend that says, it's a crime in progress, right. <laughs> but but it is a continuing and ongoing process. And it is one wherein time travel and the loops permitted to us by Afrofuturism can coexist in peace, right? These ideas and these slippages work together in ways that allow for possibilities that recognize the past and incorporate, integrate, and draw from them in productive creative performance. I want to start the explanation of Afrofuturism, and, and I know you see it, right? This is what it's not, <laughs> okay? There is some relationship between Afrofuturism and science fiction, but they are not one and the same. Afrofuturism is not new. It didn't just drop to the planet. Been here a while, right? Um, been here in the imaginations. Just as the, as the continental African experience lives in the imagination of many in the diaspora who have never been there, right? This is a product of the imagination. Um, and it's not just frivolous fantasy, self-indulgent play. It's not, right? So that's what Afrofuturism is not. And drawing on Isaiah Lavender III and some particular points I think are relevant here, this is what I want to say Afrofuturism is, right? A critical reading practice, a mode of creative production, artistic practice, what Monet does in Dirty Computer. It responds to the moment in which it is created, the work is created, it generates necessary intellectual dynamism and offers you know, a jolt of discovery to new truths. We would be here for four hours if I went through only one video, right? And indexed or uncovered the index of political, intellectual and creative endeavor that Monet is engaged in, in her, um, in her emotion picture. It is productive and opens up space for discovery. And by so doing has re uh, revolutionary potential, can change history's whitewashed narratives, past, present, and future, and create new geographies. And there is an intersection in this last point that I want you all to keep in mind. When we think about the diaspora, it is many places. It is not a fixed location. It is an ongoing geography of creative, political, and intellectual production. And Afrofuturism as intersecting these impulses helps create or helps acknowledge and create geographies to which one can belong. And belonging is a central question of black diasporic politics. And how does this belonging happen? How does this belonging, how does this community, how does this creative imagination that is shared between groups of people across different cultural media and productive forms happen? Isaiah Lavender's point is that there is an access to something called a black networked consciousness that is a key tenet of Afrofuturism. And this is the wave that Monet rides in uh, Dirty Computer, offering us a communal imaginary and a material shared history of the Black Atlantic, drawing on a network of deep meaning and references. Monet herself becomes a vessel through which intellectual and creative 
musical and visual uh, impulses and forms travel, right? When I say there is an inheritance, there is also a passing on. And Monet acknowledges this, particularly in Django Jane, where she references the cultural producers Baldwin and Baker and Shonda Rhimes and Viola Davis as a part of this network conscious into which she is hooked. And narrating herself within the material worlds as working class, a working class outsider, an outsider that is consistent with herself as previously an android and now an out black queer woman, right? Because this is the turning point is an important uh, uh, declaration to have acknowledged about the work. So intersectionality is operating at multiple levels of Monet's work. The black network consciousness suggests through Afrofuturism, communal memories and traditions, we link the past, present and future, make possible the hope that black people wish to experience from a painful past in building black futures. This black network consciousness generates hope, right? A charged impulse representing a desire for life, right? You can't get rid of me, I'm gonna be here. And an essential psychic drive seeding resistance, rebellion and subversion, writing in the coming future of America, right? And Monet herself imagines through a multitude of creative forms and offers through a multitude of creative forms, black people in a different dynamic, powerful, technologically informed future where we are conscious of our past, but not constrained by it. If we use hidden figures as the jumping off point for dirty computer, which emerges two years later, hidden figures in 2016 and a dirty computer in 2018. This is a very, you know, uh, interesting and practical leap. And in Mon and Monet's project, and and she has many, but the overall project that she is engaged with at multiple levels is influenced, or we experience within it a trace of the likes of Octavia Butler in particular, and W.E.B. Du Bois, who is a pillar of black thought, black intellectualism and black radical consciousness. My claim in Dirty Computer, Janelle Monet assumes a new level of authority over her creative fortunes in the public sphere. Her public narrative as an artist her power to claim the erotic to love herself and other black women and black people in general, Monet's owning of herself, right? And owning of oneself as a woman in the black diaspora is a radical political act of resistance and reclaiming one's body as a site of pleasure, erotics and joy, living in a legacy of a body, your body, having been framed and still existing in our public culture as a site of derision, a site of uh, historical shame and a site of property is a transformative political message for those who engage and follow her work. Monet focuses on issues of power, sexuality, love and humanity. She is from droid to woman and love, right? Monet's authors herself and her story on her own terms were in black people, black and her and their black for our black forebears are the center of her consciousness and her concerns. No compromises. <clears throat> Django Jane as I've said earlier, is at the heart of this uh, emotion picture. It constitutes um, the heart from which beats all of the impulses in the various other videos in this liberation narrative. It's undergirded by an erotics that is visual 
and linguistic and narrative and potent. The video is a site of cultural production that indexes the Atlantic Black diasporic identity and expresses them in the form of a networked consciousness of Afrofuturism and offers a unique queer Black declaration of present and future multi-talented tech engaged Black diasporic performance. Let's take a look. In Django Jane, we see Monet glammed out with hip hop braggadocio as Jane Bond, not an anonymous Jane Doe, dapperly clad in dramatic Afrofuturistic dandy locks, hair and pussy power pumps. In her song, she indexes a barrage of personal triumph over struggle, Black Atlantic brilliance and references Atlantic crossings of Baldwin and Baker and others who fled the US to speak truth to power. Is, is continuing. Monet's creative vision is a politics that comprises Black Atlantic, Black feminist, Afrofuturistic principles, and art becomes a personal and professionally productive business model. And if America proposes to rid itself of Black people, as Monet says, they better put a flag on a whole other planet. Pink is the color of the erotic and the color of political liberation and pleasure and play. And she is putting herself a creative chalice on the line for the culture. In her speech at the Grammy, at the 2018 uh, Grammy Awards, Monet gave what has come to be known as a time up speech where she spoke very eloquently about the barriers that lie before women in various creative um, endeavors. And she ended that speech with the phrase, we come in peace, but we mean business, which I believe aptly captures the point that she is making and the points that she makes about the seriousness with which she takes her art. As a um, Afrofuturist text and product, uh, Dirty Computer presents us with a lot of opportunities to examine a new vision of Black feminist, Black Atlantic, and diasporic political culture. And Janelle Monet, I think, uh, is an ideal figure through which to do that. So I want to ask you, having considered what I have presented to you as some of the aims and, and focuses and intentionality, and multi-level commitment of the work that she does as an Afrofuturist cultural producer. Um, I want to take it out of the realm of it being something that you have to, to be Janelle Monet to do, because we're not Janelle Monet, <laughs> right? Um, and, and make it personal, right? How, as an everyday practice, can we uh, take some of the threads of African Afrofuturism and braid them or unbraid them in our daily lives. And I think one of the more uh, radical, you know, for some radical ideas that is taken for granted in Afrofuturism, but at the very base level we can do is imagine a future with Black folks in it and at the center of it. Um, and what, you know, here's some suggested ideas about, you know, creating a daily practice, envisioning your place in the future, respond to the moment, the location that you're in consciously and deliberately, embrace intellectual and creative dynamism rather than taking the simple shot out. When we think about our influence 
and our place in the world. And sometimes acting in revolutionary ways, trusting in the erotics and the love of who we are, represent and can be, and write and own our own narratives as people. And in these ways, we can chart our own ge geographies in the future, no matter who, no matter where we are. So I, I wanna thank you for your time and attention and I would love to open it up to you to hear your thoughts. Wow, that was flat out outstanding. Yes, thank you I, so I wish much. we had another hour. <laughs> right, right. To go with this, right? Um, Absolutely. You know, ho hopefully, Dr. Mays, I know Dr. Brown is on that line. Hopefully, you know, the NML, NMBLC will see fit to have us come back at some point and, and continue these conversations. What a great... Uh, Sirius, thank you for capping that off with a remarkable lecture. We're going to move into our after effects and try to get to as many of the questions as 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 we can. And um, also, uh, just to mention before we go into the after effects, we want to thank you all, thank our viewers for being here. Uh, and we also want to thank our evaluation gods. We want to, you know, continue programs like these, as Dr. Coleman had said, and to have individuals and presenters like Dr. Mays return for more programming. Uh, so before you go, and before we go to after effects, we want you to answer um, our closing survey. Uh, we would like you to do this because your support and feedback are what uh, is able to make series like these possible. So we can be at the mercy of the evaluation gods to bring us good fortune and funding so we can continue this work. So in the Zoom chat, please complete our very, very, very short survey for us um, that you are welcome to do at this point. And you can also scan the QR code that's on the screen. Again, it would mean the world to us as, as an organization if you could fill this out. In our quest to appease the evaluation gods, let the gods know that you want more programming like this. Again, there's a link in the Zoom chat that will take you right to the survey, or you can scan the QR code on the screen with your phone. So now, now it's time for our favorite part of the show, the After Effects. If you're able to stay on, this is where we will take all your questions from the presentation and dig in a little deeper into the subject. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question in the open Q&A earlier, we are dropping the link once again right now into the chat for you. So if you're able to do so, put any questions you have. And at this time, I'll just give it over to Dr. Coleman and Dr. Mays. Yeah, sorry, Kendra, for jumping forward in, in the in the script. Just uh, so excited to get to this part of the of the show. I apologize for 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 jumping jumping ahead like that. Um, so uh, let me see if I can get my screen to where we can. There we go. Great. Uh, the concept of no return is mind blowing, right? Uh, nothing left to lose, everything to gain. I love this and needed it today. I'm glad, like that comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good one. Yeah. What does what does a daily practice look like, Dr. Mage? What does a daily practice look like? Um, you know, for me, I, I really had to test myself on this during COVID. Right. Uh, and one of the things that that you know, for me, it's as simple as sort of being in contact with um, the moment of waking up and saying, you know what? You weren't meant to be here and you are. So somebody loved you into the future, mm. right? And, and you own, you need to own that and take that into your day, right? Um, and from there, you know, just recognizing that it, as, as challenging as it may be for all of us, certainly. And, and for me as a black woman and a black queer woman in, in New Mexico in 2021, I think, wow, okay. Um, how can I show up as fully as I can in my day, right? Mm -hmm. And represent and represent my people, right? Represent, represent the triumph of who I am, even when you know, people, systems, and circumstances often want me to put my head down, 
you know, not, not in a way that's overt, but in a way that sometimes we don't get fully seen. And this came up in, our, in, in uh, Dr. Brown's talk, the difference between seeing somebody and looking at somebody, right? Um, and and holding, holding the space even when you know you're not being seen, right? Um, and, and honoring that. Yeah, I, and I, I think complementing that, that forward look, you know, it's, I, I think it's important to complement that with a gratitude for those sacrifices, looking back at that past and honoring those sacrifices that allow us to be seen right now. You know, it, that, that visibility doesn't come. I think we, 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 we have to also look back to that past and cherish it. Um, the next question is a two-parter. Actually, it's a three-parter. Uh, maybe we don't get all three of these. Uh, where her memories being erased so she could have no recollection of the abuse that she suffered. Um, how is that relevant to all of us? What can we do to connect to do do to remember and and correct? I mean, I, I, th those are those scenes. Um, well, I'll let you. Your presentation, I'd love to, to jump on that. <laughs> well, I think, you know, when, when um, in Django Jane, Janelle Monet is talking about growing up with working class parents in Kansas City. And she's mm -hmm. talking about the struggle, but she's not talking about the struggle as something that is somehow undignified. There's right. dignity in the struggle. Like mama was a G, like this is, you know, this is who I am and this is where we're from. And that's okay. Right, that's not where we're at anymore, right? But we're not going to forget that because that's a part of the package, right? And, that's a part to, of the life. And to recognize those memories, to recognize that noble survival is subversive. I mean, it, it's it's taken as subversive sometimes by mainstream culture. Mainstream culture. The very fact that you exist, that you have survived, is an affront to a system designed to keep that from happening. You know, I love the way you. Put, you, you said it at, uh, in the last question, right? Like you weren't supposed to be here. If everything went the way it was supposed to go, you wouldn't be here, right? That we have to, uh, and so erasing that out, I love that as a subversive uh, effort. It is important to all of us to recognize that, no? What's right? our next and, question? And, and as is the tendency of Afrofuturism, right? We have to play with, we have to take time. Like, Linear time is a Western European concept, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we, we have to take it back, right? And, and be forward thinking and in the moment and projecting beyond, right? And having at the core of it, right? That second part of the black network consciousness, right? Which is hope, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, we used to joke about it when I was a kid because we we sort of make fun of Jesse Jackson, keep hope alive. But as an adult, it has a whole different tenor, right? <laughs> hey, we've got time for about one more. This this last question is a, is a good one. Um, how do we, you know, we, do we all get to create an alter ego? I guess that question. I think we already all, all of us create an alter ego anyway and send it out into the world. But do we all get to create an alter ego without being seen as reality deniers? Or is it okay to be a reality denier? Well, you know, I, um, I taught a, a course on Octavia Butler last semester, last semester. And one of the books, and I would suggest that you get Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, um, Lavender's Lavender. book. But yeah. one of the points that, that comes up in that book is, you know, there's an explanation of race as a concept that is just flat out sounds like science fiction, right? The reality of race that we live, the way by which people are, and uh, you know, the way by which people are judged and have access to opportunities based on some arbitrary system related to your complexion or your geographic location that gets to measure your human. Isn't that science? I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But that's the reality. So what's so odd, so odd about creating an alter, alter ego to, to you know, protect yourself or fortify yourself against such an absurd reality. Yeah. I mean, when, when we look at the history of the diaspora, I, I can't think of a more surreal human experience than, than, than what went into creating the, the communities that we're in. And I think 
the most surreal part about it, and maybe this is a good point to stop on, is that we survived it. We tend to look back on the diaspora as the, like that crime in progress. We are talking about one of the most incredible survival stories in human history. That we haven't just survived, we've thrived. And we've got problems to work out, things that need to get fixed. But at the end of the day, we should celebrate the remarkable expanse in the universe that allowed us to get to something like Afrofuturism. Hey, let's call it an afternoon. Oh, actually, you all have, if you want to answer more questions, we do have more time. Uh, just oh, you do. your discretion, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, so for folk, we want to respect people who, um, who need to check out. That's cool. Check out if you need to. Um, but yeah, I would love to do a few more questions. Are you down with that? Yes, that's absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Do we all get to create an alter ego? That's the question that we had from before. Can we go to the next question there? Wow. Can our aspirational visions ever be realized as long as racism and white supremacy exist? You know, I, do you mind if I jump this one first? Yes, please. Go ahead. Right. I think that there's there's a premise in the question that we have to question, right? Um, what that suggests is that we have not achieved our aspirations and our visions, right? And I think that I think that that's not wholly true. Um, there are visions and um, aspirations that so many of us have accomplished. I think about all that Janelle Monet has accomplished in her career, the aspirations that she must have had as an artist, as a young person, and how far she's come. Um, when we see the kind of cultural production that we see on the screen from people like her, I think she's a genius. I think Kendrick Lamar is a genius. I think that entire generation of, of producers, they are actually delivering in spite of racism, in spite of white supremacy. So white supremacy can exist, but that doesn't mean that it has to have um, a dampening effect on our aspirations, or our visions. Mm -hmm. We can't give it eminent domain. Exactly. Right? And, yeah. and, and, and the way that I, that I understand Janelle Monae's dealing with it is Wonderland, right? She created right. and participated in communities that became her domain. This is where I'm making my art. I'll deal with Warner Brothers, but I'm keeping the land, okay? Right. I, I, I'll deal with mainstream popular, you know, uh, appreciation, but I, I choose my mentors in Stevie Wonder and Prince, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. I, I, I hearken back to and acknowledge and own all of, the, all of that, all that is beautiful and amazing in black consciousness that I'm on the circuit to get. And that will be where I call home. And it's processual and it's dynamic and it's beautiful, right? And it doesn't bow to the constricts of colonialism. We, we do this in spite of white supremacy, not because of white supremacy. I think that's an important note. How about the next question? I think that was our last one. That's our last question? <laughs> yeah. Great. So, so, yeah, thanks everyone for all those great questions. Those of you who stuck, stuck it out here to the end with us. Um, and thank you. Um, I, I need to say thank you directly to my sister, Kathy McGill, who is behind the scenes making all of this stuff happen. We love you. We, we just uh, honor you and thank you for an opportunity to bring our voices into the community. And uh, hey, Good luck with everything that we're going to do for the rest of, of this season. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity just as a, a member of our community to have been part of this. So peace, peace. thank I you am, so much. I am honored and humble and thank you and bless you, Catherine McGill and um, always there in the struggle with you, right? And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kimberly and Kendra and I'm trying to I'm trying to see if people are here. And Tanya, thank you for all your help, and thank you, Dr. Coleman, for your support and uh, your delightful hosting today. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you all. And again, once again, let's give it up for our presenter today, Dr. Andrea Mays, and our moderator, Dr. Finney Coleman, for answering our questions and leading a great and 
an integral discussion regarding this topic in the lecture series. So drop your hands, hearts, thumbs up in the chat, give them some love. And of course, we cannot forget to thank our staff that makes this all possible here at the NMBLC. Big thank you to Catherine McGill, Shauna Brown, Mason Graham, Amber Jeanson, and Tanya Bryant for all the amazing work that you do to bring these events to life. So much hard work and planning goes into these events by us for you, so thank you. And don't forget to connect with us on social media on our website, nmblc.org, or at N New Mexico Black on Instagram and at nmblc on Facebook. And if you have any questions, we also have email. Shoot us an email at info at nmblc.org. And up next, we want to give you all firsthand scoop on upcoming programming by the New Mexico Black Leadership Council. We have on May 2nd, our One New Mexico Gospel Concert, our New Mexico Black Health and Wellness Conference, also in May. And lastly, if you have any children or teens, we implore you to, to consider enrolling them in our Roots Summer Leadership Academy this year, scheduled for July, 2021. And if you know someone uh, between the ages of 14 and 24 years old and they're of Asian American Pacific Islander or uh, Black African descent in New Mexico, we want to let you know that there is a paid, paid arts-based opportunity titled True New Mexico, which invites youth artists to create a self-portrait that showcases their individual expressions and describes their experiences with racism and prejudice in New Mexico. The deadline to apply is today by 11.59 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, so please click the link we just dropped in the chat, the Zoom chat, for more information. And once again, I'd like to thank our friends at the African American Student Services at the University of New Mexico for being a partner for this series. Special thanks to Brandy Stone and Jay Gordeen for all of their support. And with that, we're closing out our series. For those of you who may have missed a lecture, we will be providing the full lectures on our social media platforms and website soon. It is our pleasure to bring you informative, riveting, thought-provoking, and inspiring content here at the New Mexico Black Leadership Council. Thank you so much and take care.